Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy cautions us to watch our words. Our speech is an index of our spirituality. What you post, what you tweet, it gives us a, a window into your heart condition. Why would I say that? Because Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 43, out of the heart the mouth speaks. What's down in the well comes out in the bucket. Welcome to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. He's senior pastor of Kindred Community Church in Anaheim Hills, California. In recent years, we've seen gas shortages, food shortages, and even toilet paper shortages. But there's certainly no shortage of words on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Yet the book of James tells us to be slow to speak and swift to listen. And Proverbs reminds us that with many words come many transgressions. So today, Pastor Philip helps us use our words wisely in part six of his series, Tech Savvy. Listen to ktt.org. Here's Philip. I maybe have the gene of an old pastor I knew back in Northern Ireland called Jim Smith. And he would often preach on a text or a sermon or a series and it would go long. He famously preached on Luke 15 on the prodigal son. And he spoke on that for weeks and weeks and weeks. In fact, the prodigal son spent weeks and weeks and weeks in the far country. So much so that one of his deacons said to Pastor Smith one day, Pastor, it's time to bring the boy home. And I'm bringing it home. We're going to wrap this up. We've been looking at the issue of tech savvy. What about technology and the Christian? You know my love for Winston Churchill. Listen to these words of this great British leader. Unless the intellect of a nation keeps abreast of material improvements, the society in which that occurs is no longer progressing. An interesting thought. Churchill understands that life is going to develop in terms of material progress and technology, but he would remind every society that they've got to think hard alongside those developments and those improvements. And they've got to have a philosophy on life as life improves and their thinking's got to keep up with their technology, so to speak. And that's what we've been trying to do in my sermon, Tech Savvy. You and I live in a tech-saturated world. We're thankful for that in so, so many ways. Our lives have been enhanced. There is human flourishing through technology, from travel to communication to medicine, whatever the case may be. But with everything in a fallen world, the upside has also got a corresponding downside. And we've been trying to think through technology and theology. We want to remind ourselves, according to Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, not to allow the world and its mindset, its disposition towards certain things, we're not to allow that world to press us into its mold. But you and I need to have a biblical mindset that indeed looks at things from a godly perspective and from a Christian worldview. Now, if you've been with us, we've covered several elements of the subject. We looked at technology as a question of thanks. We looked at technology as a question of time. We looked at technology as a question of triviality. We looked at technology as a question of truth. We looked at technology, lastly, as a question of temptation. There are many temptations associated with technology. Number one, self-promotion. Number two, human approval. Number three, envy and covetousness, materialism. Number four, and we spent two weeks on this in recent days, lust and sexual sin. We looked at the whole issue of pornography, which is so pernicious on the World Wide Web. But I have one more I want to talk about very quickly before we move on to look at the question of thought, the question of togetherness, and the question of tyranny. The temptation of overtalk. The temptation of overtalk. I don't know if you've realized this, but the digital world has made us all talking heads. Social media is a grave temptation in the arena of speech and the use of the tongue. And that's important to you and me as Christians. Number one, because 
Our speech is an index of our spirituality. What you post, what you tweet, what you Twitter, and what you text, it gives us a, a window into your heart condition. Why would I say that? Because Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 43, out of the heart the mouth speaks. You know, what's down in the well comes out in the bucket. James 1, 26 reminds us, hey, you want to know about the measure or the health of a man's religion? And then ask yourself this question, does he control his tongue? Because the man that can't control his tongue, the woman that doesn't censor her speech, has got a religion that's vain and empty and weightless. And then on top of that, what about Proverbs 18.21? This is a staggering verse. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. That's amazing. That Bible verse is saying to you and to me, what we do with spoken words and written words will determine the quality of life, relationships, and society. That's amazing. So the digital world tempts us in this arena. We're texting all the time. Chat rooms, Twitter, Facebook, posts, blogs. There's a never-ending streaming and spewing of speech. And I don't think it's for our good. We're talking more without talking to each other. Think about that. We're talking more than ever without talking to each other. And we're certainly talking more and listening less. Everybody's become an expert. Everybody's become an opinion columnist. Everybody's become a self-publishing author. Happy to tell you their view on everything from vaccinations to the latest movie. There's this rush to be heard. It's kind of scary. And it's an arena of temptation because the Bible and the book of Proverbs warns us about the sins of the tongue, slander, spreading lies and falsehoods, gossip, breaking confidences, flattery, use of coarse and crude dialogue. And here's the one I want to talk about for a few moments, the danger of talking too much. The danger of talking too much. Let me give you a few verses that will, will speak to this. The biggest one is Proverbs 10, verse 19. I think I heard this verse for the first time in a class on the sins of the tongue by Wayne Mack at the Master's University. Listen to Proverbs 10, verse 19. In a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. What's that verse saying? It's saying this, the more you talk, the more likely you are to sin. Because remember what James says, the half-brother of Jesus? No man is perfect in his language. Just like a horse needs a bit and a ship needs a rudder, you and I need to control our speech because none of us are perfect in it. And the more we talk, the more danger of sinning with our tongues. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wide. It's, you know what? I'm not going to tweet on that. That's a wise thing. I think I agree with you on that. I'm not going to blog on that. Good choice. He who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is like choice silver. Talking about restraint, write down Proverbs 18, 13. I'll read it for you. He who answers a matter before he hears it, folly and shame. You ever heard that old wisdom? Better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and prove it. That's what the Proverbs teaches us. He who answers a matter before he hears it. People are tweeting and texting and blogging and writing within minutes of a news story, within minutes of a conversation. It's wrong. It's dangerous. Very dangerous. Too much talk in our society. We're talking more than ever and talking less than ever. We're talking more than ever and listening less and learning less. It's one of the great dangers of technology. Here's another verse, 17. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. How many times are you watching on television retractions? Because 24-7 news, cable, 
We want immediate opinions. We want immediate conclusions. And the first person to speak usually has to retract. Because listen to the verse, the first one who pleads seems right until his neighbor comes along and said, I think you forgot this little piece of information. Did you know this when you said that? That's what the Bible said. Be careful to be the first person to say anything on anything. Because have you taken enough time to listen? Have you taken enough time to research? Are you sure there's not another opinion that's going to contradict your convictions so quickly formed? The Bible addresses this stuff all the time. I think there's one other verse here. Proverbs 29, verse 20. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. See, here's what's interesting. Let me go over this for a few minutes. If I was just to draw a contrast between the age of printed materials and books and the age of technology and tweets and texts and blogs, there's a great difference. Look, let me say this. I don't want to seem a Luddite, and I don't want to seem overly negative. I am thankful for the democratizing of the ability for voices to be heard and views to be expressed. That's a good thing in a free society. And certainly in the United States, we love the idea of free speech. That's a good thing. In many ways, we have given voice to the voiceless. I think of high technology has allowed voices to be heard in China and Hong Kong and North Korea and places where there is no free speech, where there may be only one media outlet that's controlled by the state. So on the one hand, I want to acknowledge that technology has been good for free speech, and it has democratized the ability for opinions to be heard. But on the other side, just when you compare it to the age of printed words, you and I need to realize that our smartphone, our tablets, our iPods, our personal computers, they present to us our own Gutenberg printing press. If you study European history and Western history, you'll realize how important the printing press was. But here's the downside to that. Everybody now gets to write a daily opinion column on anything they choose. They get to write their own autobiography of who they think they are. They get to write their version of history. I could go on. I'm not sure that's all good because let's just take an analogy between, say, a newspaper columnist or someone writing a book or, or publishing you know, a peer-reviewed article. Before that ever sees the light of day, what happens? There's pre-publication accountability. There's the checking of facts, or at least we like to hope so. There's the process of refinement. There's perhaps a conversation that takes place in, a, in an editor's room or at an academic council where the subject is deepened and broadened. There's an editorial board that might change some of that. Then there's forewords and endorsements from experts or interested parties in the field. But the digital world bypasses all of that. And I'm not sure that's good because it allows us to talk too much about too much without much reflection, humility, knowledge, or counterbalance. As we have said, with the multiplication of words, you have the addition of sin, and with the addition of sin, you have the subtraction of wisdom. In fact, after first service, when I said that, somebody gave me a great quote where they said, have you heard this one, Pastor, that Facebook has never caused the blind to see, but it has caused the dumb to speak. <laughs> it's a great quote. You may want to write that down. Facebook has never caused the blind to see, but it has caused the dumb to speak. Because we like to give our opinion. In today's environment with COVID, everybody's a virologist now, expert on viruses, vaccines. I've been amazed in conversations with Christians of how quickly they discount the thinking of men and women who have been to medical school for seven years, whose heart, I believe, is moved by current compassion not by big pharmacy. It's amazing the opinions that are being spouted, how quickly we address theological issues. 
how quickly we censor brothers and sisters in Christ who differ with us on things. In a multitude of words, sin is, is not lacking. Be warned. What the Bible says, be slow to speak. Okay? Be slow to speak. Don't tweet or text before dinner. Maybe don't tweet or text before Wednesday. I don't know what that is. But be slow to speak. Be swift to hear. James 1 verse 19. God give you one mouth and two ears. I think he's trying to say something. And let's measure our competency. I hope you realize you don't know everything about everything. That's what Romans 12, 3 says about spiritual gifts. Measure yourself. Don't think of yourself too highly. Maybe your opinions aren't as good as you think they are. Are they peer-reviewed? Have, they, have you run them by someone? When's the last time you read a 300-page book on theology? Or the American Journal for Medicine? Before you start addressing a bunch of things? Are you adding to the conversation? Or just wanting to be heard? To be nasty? Proud? Arrogant? Huh. It's a challenge to us all, isn't it? Be slow to speak, swift to hear. Measure your competency fairly. Seek the wisdom and listen to the wise. Typically, the wise is someone that's lived a lot longer than you, seen a lot more than you, read a lot more than you, and done a lot more than you, and learned by their mistakes along the way. That's what wisdom is in the book of Proverbs. It's not knowledge. It's the right application of knowledge. It's a seasoned perspective on life. It's measured. It's limited. It's balanced. And then what about mind your own business? The internet in invites us to be busybodies. Go back to Proverbs. Proverbs 26, 16 to 17. Write it down. Look at it later. Here's what it says. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. He passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own like one who takes the ears of a dog. You ever gone up to a dog and grabbed it by its ears? No, you're, you're smarter than that. Well, you're smarter than that until you go onto your phone and use your technology. Then you go meddling and spouting and giving opinions that haven't been thought out, compared, challenged, written in humility. I think you get the point. I can tell by your looks on the quietness. It's time to move on. We can't move on till I tell you a little story by Churchill. One day he was out walking with his bodyguard along King's Charles Street in London on their way to Downing Street when a newspaper boy was approaching them, whistling, happy as Larry. And as he went by Churchill, Churchill said, stop whistling. The young fellow went by. I don't know if he recognized that this was the great Churchill, but he wasn't by him a few feet. Then he turned around and he told him, why should I? And then a few more feet on, he turned to Churchill and he said, you can shut your ears, can't you? And as Churchill walked on, he started laughing and chuckling because he got it. I can't shut my ears. Why not just leave the kid alone? You can shut your ears, can't you? Mind your own business, Mr. Churchill. It's a good lesson. You know, there's so much that comes our way in terms of information and news and, and opinion and, and cultural conversation. You know, it, it's not that we're to disengage. It's not that we're not to be concerned. We're, just to, we're meant to be smart and intuitive and wise in our responses. And a lot of the time, you know what? Proverbs 26, 16 to 17 or 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, lead a quiet and peaceable life. Work with your hands and mind your own business. Don't you agree with me uh, with agreeing with D.L. Moody who said, the greatest trouble I, I have as a man is myself. My greatest trouble is D.L. Moody. I have enough business working on my, with myself and on myself. Can't you stop your ears? Can't you close your eyes? Can't you mind your own business? All right, let's move on quickly. Three other areas I want to quickly touch on. The question of thought the question of togetherness and the question of tyranny. The question of thought, togetherness, and tyranny. Let's start with the question of thought. Again, we, we want to be balanced here. We want to give honor where honor is due. We want to recognize good things 
around us. And certainly, technology is a wonderful educational tool. I certainly use it to my benefit in biblical studies. I've got access to a whole library now of journal articles. If I can't remember where a verse is in the Bible, I'd have pulled, used to pull down either my old Strong's or Young's Concordance, and now all I need to do is remember the phrase, put it in Google, and hey, presto, there it is. It's very efficient, very helpful. You can do word searches. You get the point. I need to tell you that technology has opened the doors to libraries and learning all around the world, and for that we are deeply thankful. It's a question of thanks. This is a grace gift from God. Amazing. But as we've said so much in this series, while technology gives, it takes. And the paradox with technology is that while it invites us to study and learn, in the same token, it diminishes our capacity to do it. The longer we use technology, evidence is piling up, the less equipped we are to study and to give serious thought and 